person and even on the live stream and watching online and, and anywhere else you may be watching. Uh, my name is Mitch. I was uh, Jane's, or I am Jane's older brother. And tonight we're going to, just to set the stage, kind of what we're going to do uh, this evening, we're going to sing a couple songs uh, because Jane, w one of the things that I loved doing with Jane and that Jane was obviously known for was singing and obviously she loved to worship the Lord. So we're going to worship this evening. We're going to sing a couple songs and then we're going to have a handful of, of her close friends and family uh, share some memories, share some impacts of the way that she had impacted their lives and allowed them to draw closer to the Lord and also just to continue on uh, in their lives. And then we're going to end uh, the service with some more singing. So I'm going to go ahead and pray. Uh, you all can stand uh, with me tonight. If you are comfortable, uh, you can sing along. If not, obviously not a big deal. I will have the lyrics on the screens for you, uh, but we're just really, really excited to be here uh, this evening. So let me pray, and then we'll sing and worship together. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, God, and we praise you, God, for the amazing love that you have for each and every one of us. God, thank you that you sent your son to die for us so that we may live. And God, we thank you that because of that reality, Jane is not no longer dead, but she is alive. She is alive in you. She has a new body. She has a new outlook on life that none, none, none of us can even understand. And Lord, we thank you for that hope that we get to hold on to. God, thank you that Jane was an amazing, amazing person that did amazing, amazing things, that ultimately all of those things originated uh, with you. So God, I pray that tonight as we sing, as we worship you in these songs, as we, even we worship you in telling stories of Jane and talking about the impacts that she had in each and every one of us, God, I pray that you would help us understand how much you love us and care for us. God, I know that you love each and every one of us individually, so God, I pray that we would feel and understand that tonight. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you, and we ask these things in your beautiful name. Amen.
Break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not. In desperation, I turned to air and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness soared through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages sent down for glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Right. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm Yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the One who set me free.
Let's sing it again, just the choruses. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that our hope is not dead, but our hope is alive. And God, we thank you that our hope is found in you and in you alone. Lord, thank you that you are not a dead God who is distant and disinterested, but instead, God, you are a God who loves us, that cares for us, that enters into human history so that we can have a hope that lives, that we don't have to spend our lives chasing hopes that do not satisfy. We don't have to spend our lives chasing hopes that do not matter. But Lord, we thank you that we have, a, as followers of Jesus, we have a hope that is alive and it is in you. And Lord, I am especially thankful tonight that Jane had a hope that was alive and that she is now with you. Lord, we celebrate that hope tonight. We celebrate the hope that Jane had. We celebrate the hope that she's now experiencing. Because hope is more, about the biblical vision of hope is more than just wishful thinking. It's more than just, oh, I hope God comes through. But rather, our hope as followers of Jesus Christ, our hope as followers of Jesus Christ is more than a hope, it's a promise. It's a promise that we will live forever with the one who loves us most. So Lord God, I pray that that us as believers tonight, those of us who know you, Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged by that hope as we hear stories about Jane, as we remember and celebrate her life and her impact. God, I pray that we would be reminded that she didn't serve a different God than we do, but that you care about each and every one of us as much as you cared about her. And for those who do not yet know you, Lord, I just pray that you would help them see the hope that we have in Christ. Oh, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you. We ask these things in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Uh, Ashley Santiago is going to come, and she's going to kick us off uh, this evening. Hello, my name is Ashley Santiago. I have pictured this moment a lot and um, I'm really extremely honored to speak to you about my friend Jane. Um, So I'm just gonna share with you a little bit about who she was to me. I think we all experience Jane in different ways, whether that was through friendship, through music, through family. And so I just wanna tell you a little bit about my friend tonight. I'm gonna pretend we're at a coffee shop and I just get to share with you a little bit about her. I first met Jane Marcheski when she was 17 years old. I was 20 and she was going to be a new youth leader on our team. And I remember driving up to Todd Garman's house and Jane was sitting in the front yard with Todd in a lawn chair. And I just remember her like talking with her hands and making this gesture. And our, our friendship kind of sprung into action or um, gained fruition that summer when we were at summer camp leading a bunch of middle schoolers. And Jane and I were in charge of like 12 fifth and sixth graders. And that first night we had partnered with a couple other churches. And that first night I, I could just tell Jane was like, she was glad to be there, but I could tell she wasn't really that excited to be there with us because she had previously gone to one of the other churches. And that night I had like, I took her by the arm and I took her back to the cabin and I was like, listen, it's you and me and 12 fifth and sixth grade girls. I need your help tell me what's up. And she was like, it's just hard to be here. That was my church. And it's hard to be here, but not a part of them. And I was like, all right. She was like, but I get it. Like it's us together. And we were bonding and probably there for like an hour. And then there are uh, two other youth leaders knock on our door and they're like, Hey, uh, are you the leaders from VGF? And we're like, yeah. And they were like, your girls are looking for you. <laughs> Uh, And I look up and all of our girls are standing behind them crying because they didn't know where we were. (laughs) So we learned a lot of lessons, needless to say. Um, I remember another year at camp, I was just struggling to understand God's forgiveness, like to really fully absorb 
understanding what God's forgiveness was in my life. And I remember saying that to Jane and she said, Ashley, when God forgives you, it's like dropping your keys in the ocean. You'll never find it. And that's how it is with God. When he looks at you, he just sees Jesus. He doesn't remember your sin. And that's how, like, that's how you can receive his forgiveness. And Jane challenged me to dream big dreams and to face my fears, whether that was through getting my nose pierced, because I hate needles, or going skinny dipping multiple times, or saying out loud that I wanted to get married in 2015, which I did, and to also uh, pranking Pam Lozano by writing Pam cakes in pancakes on her roof. We had a lot of fun together, and I, uh, I actually lost both of my parents to cancer, so when, and a niece. Um, so when Jane called me up in 2017 and said, hey, this is my diagnosis, um, I was terrified, to be honest, because I, I just told her, I was like, I hate this for you, because I know the road of suffering you're gonna have to walk but I also know that if you press into Jesus and you, you dig into your faith, you're going to have like a, an understanding of God that you've never had before. And, and I believe that she did. Like I saw that happen with both of my parents when they were sick. They just had this supernatural faith come over them. And Jane had that completely. I think that when it comes to our greatest fears, Satan doesn't reinvent the wheel. He just keeps telling us the same lie over and over again. And so after she was, um, she had gotten the diagnosis that she had a 2% chance to live three to six months. She had moved out to Southern California where I was, I was living. And I went up to visit her and I said, how are you? How, how are you processing all of this? How are you? And she said, I guess I'm not afraid because I know him and, and I trust him and I'm, I'm not afraid. And she just, I found that through that experience, she ministered to me so much more. I wanted to be there for her and I tried to be there as her friend, but I found so much more through her cancer experience. She ministered to all of us. That's why we're all here. And it's true, you can't know Jane and not know about the love of Jesus. Jane had this hope. She had a hope so otherworldly because it was. And she coined the phrase rebellious hope. And I love that because she was fierce. Jane was fierce. She was a fighter and she was spicy. <laughs> and I think that she's challenged all of us. She's her story has resonated with so much of us because she was so unique and supernatural in her faith. Every year I get Jane a journal for Christmas. It has to be a specific kind of journal. It can't have any lines in it because her thoughts cannot be contained by lines. <laughs> it has to be a little sparkly and a little pretty, so it's inspiring. And I had gotten her journal this year for Christmas and after she passed, I had gone up to visit and Sharon let me look at it. And she had written in it four pages in a row, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, and I just wanted to share that with you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you for letting me come share with you about my friend Jane. Andrew, I don't know where Andrew is. Oh, goodness. I didn't um, really start getting nervous until like 25 minutes ago, I think, probably 30 minutes ago. Um, there's so much I could talk about Jane, so much I could say about Jane. Um, and I'm sure there's so many stories out there that I don't even know about um, of Jane. Um, she, um, I, I miss her. Uh, I loved her so much. Um, I'm just going to tell um, a couple stories and, and, and just some um, 
characteristics about her. Um, a lot of bonding time with me and Jane was done over road trips. Um, we did two trips across America. We drove um, to a couple national parks, California. Um, specifically, um, there's one I remember that was probably 12, 13 years ago. Um, she was um, she she was going to, off to college, and my mom and I and Jane and her boyfriend at the time got in a car and we drove from Ohio to Virginia and we got a hotel room and um, Jane, we, we had decided to hang out at the pool so we, we started playing charades and um, Jane thought it was a good idea to act out Pocahontas by diving into a five foot swimming pool and she, um, she left a gash on, right in her forehead because she smacked her face on the bottom of the pool. And she was so upset that her first day at college, all the people that she was going to meet, that she was going to have this gash on her forehead. And it's funny, I was, I was literally talking to Abby Rodriguez uh, this morning, who's going to uh, talk in a few minutes. And, and I didn't bring up this story, and she said, yeah, actually the first day I met Jane, she had this big gash on her forehead. <laughs> um, there's, so many, there's so much about Jane I could talk about. Um, so much I could, I could continue to tell. Um, she was a very public person. She was very good um, in front of people. She was good at connecting with people, uh, with a crowd in a very genuine way. Um, but she was also very caring, compassionate in a, in a private and personal way um, that people didn't see. And she wasn't showy about it. And she didn't draw attention to herself. Um, when I... Um, when she was first starting, when she first moved out to California and I was with her, she was first starting to, the treatments were starting to take good effect. She was starting to feel really uh, a lot better. Um, she was starting to drive, drive places. She, she had met people at the clinic she was at, um, people who had also had cancer and were going through similar things as she was. And as soon as she was like starting to feel good, she was, she was driving to people's houses helping people get groceries, helping them get them stuff for their apartment. Um, she, and I didn't realize she was, she was doing this for probably two or three weeks before I didn't even realize it. She was just leaving the house, going, going back and forth. Um, just, just helping people out. Um, more recently, um, <clears throat> I think it was December, um, she, we were at, the, we were at her, her clinic, she had a treatment day and one of her friends uh, showed up. Um, and Jane was kind of sick at the time. Um, not as bad as she was past month or two, I guess. Not as bad as she was, you know, right before she passed. But she was still in rough shape. And her friend was r really, really bad shape at the time. And, and Jane, Jane told me, we have to, we can't let her drive herself, herself home. She's, she's in pain. She's in really rough shape. We have to take her home. And to my shame, I, I wasn't, like, super excited about the idea. I was thinking, well, Jane is sick. You know, I'm, we're not doing so well ourselves. So I, I was trying to figure out another way to help her. And Jane's like, no way. We have to, we have to take her home. So we, we brought her home. Um, she, she stayed over the night. We took her, um, we took her to the ER the next morning. Um, and... Um, she was in really rough shape. I thought I wouldn't see her again, but um, today she's actually responding really well to treatments. Um, and I can't say this for sure, but maybe, maybe Jane saved her life by, by bringing her in uh, that night. Um, it was a really caring and compassionate thing to do, a uh, self-sacrificial thing to do. And Jane is, Jane is pretty sick herself, and she wants to take somebody else in. Um, another thing about Jane that you all know, she, she was a fighter. So she gets this prognosis from her doctor in January 2020, and she doesn't um, she doesn't accept it. She she decides I'm gonna I'm gonna. She was she had so many ideas. She was gonna go to Mexico to some um, you know illegal clinic. She was she was had all these ideas of what she was gonna you know gonna do. But she found this doctor in California, and, and uh, my brother Mitch flew out with her, and she started treatments. Um, and um, 
her, her doctor in, in Tennessee had given her three, three to six months. Um, and here we are, you know, two years later, and she was, she was fighting up to the very end. Um, the day she passed, um, literally, um, this, this poem on the back of this, this brochure, I'd never read this before today. Um, but it's, it's like, it's, it's so true. Like, especially the second, second section. I want to die while my heart is still a greenhouse for hope. All my wild dreams as seedlings and egg cartons reaching toward the window. Um, the day Jane passed away, she, could, she couldn't walk and she could, she could barely talk. But she was sitting up in her bed and she was doing vocal exercises. She was doing scales. She was saying, how now, brown cow. She was doing all sorts of, sorts of things to, to get her voice back. And she was telling my mom, I can't wait until I can, I can get out of bed and walk over to the piano and play the piano again. Um, so she was fighting up to the very end. Um, and that's, that's really, um, it just, it's just a witness to the, her fighting spirit and it's really an inspiration. Um, <clears throat> Second Corinthians 4.8, uh, the Apostle Paul um, talks about his suffering, that he was afflicted on every side, but not crushed, um, perplexed, but not in despair. And I think, um, I think that describes Jane, especially the, the second line, perplexed, but not in despair. Um, she had a lot of complaints, not to people, not to other people, but she, she complained to God in her prayers. She, she said, you know, you've read her blog. She didn't, she didn't know why she was suffering. She was perplexed by it. She was baffled. She didn't understand what was going on. But she wasn't driven to despair. She still held forth a hope um, that even though she didn't understand, um, that she had hope in God and she, she um, had faith in his purposes and in his goodness. Um, and I think that's something to learn from. Um, and I've been thinking, how does, how does somebody in the face of suffering, in the, safe, in the face of um, pain, um, afflictions, of every, afflictions of every kind, you know, physical, psychological, relational, um, afflictions of every kind, but not be crushed by them. Um, it's, uh, what, what, it, what has to be true about a person in order for them to, to have that sort of hope? Um, and that, that sort of faith. And I've been thinking about Hebrews 11, 6, that, that in order to please God, um, it's impossible to please God without faith because in order to please God and draw near to God, you must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who, um, who diligently seek him. Um, so you have two propositions. You have to believe that God is real. You have to believe that he's the creator of the universe, um, that, he, that he is who he says he is. But you also have to believe something about his character. You have to believe that he's good. Um, you have to believe that if you come to him, he's not going to kick you while you're down, but he's actually going to lift you up. Um, and in order to have, how do, how do you, sometimes when you're suffering, it's easier to, it's easier to believe that God exists than it is to believe that he's, he's good. Sometimes it's really hard to believe that God is good when you're really suffering and you're not hearing an answer to your prayers, the type of answers you want to hear. Um, so, so, so how do you believe that God is good? Um, and I heard a sermon day after Jane died. It was just a small part of the sermon. It wasn't the main point of the sermon, but the, the, the verse that was quoted was Romans 5.8. Um, and by this, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have present tense and past tense. God presently, right now, in the moment, ongoing, demonstrates his love for us by the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, past tense. So we have a past tense, concrete action of, of, of Christ's death for us, God. God giving his son for us that demonstrates um, from now into, into eternity his love for us. And, and because of that love, we can draw near. Um, we can believe that when we draw near to God that he's not going to kick us when, he, when we're down and he's not going to. Um, he's, he's, 
He's not, we, we say, I, I'm sorry, and he says, yeah, you should be sorry. He's not, he's not going to have that sort of attitude. He's going to welcome you in. Um, so um, my, my goal was not to ramble. Um, I cut some stories. I want to be short. Um, but I, um, I hope that Jane, uh, I know that Jane was an inspiration to you all, and I hope that she continues to be, be so. Um, and thank you for all for being here. Caitlin, um, my sister, my younger sister, is going to sing us a song that she wrote. Um, yeah, for those of you who have never met me before, my name is Caitlin. I am Jane's younger sister. Um, when my family asked me if I wanted to share, I, I've been having a hard time articulating into words the way that I'm feeling. Um, you know, how can you articulate into words who Jane was and, and what she meant to us? And, um, so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask God to help me write a song. And the next morning he did. And so, um, yeah, here's my song. <laughs> Tomorrow's not promised Nothing was made to last Except for God's word Which will always come to pass Each morning we're given A chance to
Caitlin, that was stunning. Jane would love that. Um, I'm Celeste. I'm one of Jane's close friends. There's my husband, Benji. He's going to be up here for moral support. Um, Jane and I met in 2016 after our husbands became close friends. We became family, sequoias humming the same melodies, sharing the same roots. Having gone through three separate cancer diagnoses, rebellious hope wasn't a slick turn of phrase, but a military doctrine, a harness that allowed Jane to hang on when her grip failed. Around the time of her first diagnosis in 2017, she had a garden. Benji and I are black thumbs, we couldn't keep weeds alive, but Jane loved the earth and soil. She told me about a dream she felt the Lord gave her. She saw herself loving, loving and laboring over that garden, fertilizing, planting, and tending. And in the dream, she awoke to find that the garden was completely destroyed. All the vegetables were gone and the garden was not able to be saved. This is a real dream she had. Heartbroken and distraught, she called out to God in fear and panic. And God said to begin digging in a different part of the yard. Confused, she obeyed. And to her surprise, she began to pull up giant multicolored carrots, potatoes, radishes, just all these vegetables growing underground. And she knew she hadn't planted them. She asked where they came from. And God in the dreams told her, when you tended to your garden, I planted and grew these for you. At the time she felt the dream meant that the life she built before cancer was destroyed but that she was not to be afraid. She hoped it was in reference to her music that sickness wouldn't cost her time or set her back professionally. But in time, we would discover that he was dispositing something greater. God, um, treasures that grew below the ground, unseen, prepared for her, not by her, love's parable. By her second diagnosis in the start of 2020, she was well acquainted with sorrow and she found God a good companion himself, also well acquainted with grief. The world is broken and at times cruel and unfair. God knew her disappointments, worries and fears. He did not need her to be polite when she was angry or confused. And to use Jane's words, she would be God's downstairs neighbor beating at the ceiling with her broom. And in these moments of crisis, she found love that would never abandon, a firm foundation, God on the bathroom floor with her. The only way she could have rebellious hope was by clinging to someone larger than her circumstances. I saw Jane run to Jesus when doctors said tumors were innumerable. I saw Jane run toward Jesus when she felt abandoned by the promises of people. And when Jane felt betrayed by God, I found her soaking in worship, confused and angry, but clinging to a truth that he is good. And she modeled for us how to endure suffering, how to grieve and how to mourn. By the third diagnosis, she didn't need fame, money, success, or even to be in love. These had already proved vanishing, echoing whispers in lonely rooms. Love would be the anchor. And what is love if not God? Jesus is why she believed a painfully tragic life could still be worth living. That life could be beautiful even when the world came crashing down. Terminal illness in, in a diagnosis is a ruthless reminder of how short life is. And for us, loving and losing Jane 
is that ruthlessness. Hebrews 11, like Andrew mentioned, um, that passage lists the biblical heroes of faith, faith defined as substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Heroes, they were heroes because they lived as pilgrims in this world just passing by. And a friend reminded me of this passage that described the heroes that died. Um, some suffered tremendously. And the Bible describes them as those of whom the world was not worthy. I count Jane among them, a nomad in this life, carrying a flame of hope to a world that did not deserve her. Thank you. Y'all have to bear with me. I did promise the family this would be funny. <clears throat> <sighs> My name is Abby and I had the most beautiful privilege of being Jane's best friend for the last 14 years. Among other things, she was magnetic, vibrant, selfless, selfless and the most profound friend of my life. Jane knew me, saw me, loved me, appreciated me exactly as I am, better than anyone in my life. We walked side by side through truly the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. The love and, admi and admiration and affection within our friendship was truly a once-in-a-lifetime gift. I've thought so much about how to put into words exactly all that Jane meant to me, and truly it's an impossible task. She was my favorite person on this earth, and losing her feels unimaginable. But if Jane was here, she would stop me right here and say, come on, Abby, don't get up there and snot into the microphone <laughs> at my funeral. Just tell them about our adventures. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes and tell you about some of our best Abby and Jane moments. But not all of them. Jane and I had this really amazing dynamic where when one of us had a crazy idea, the other person would almost try to outdo it and make it even a little bit more crazy. So we had a day like this about two years into our shenanigans when Jane came up to me in the hallway and said, hey, let's go turn my minivan into the cash cab and pick up random strangers on the sidewalks. Of course I said, yeah, and let's get strobe lights and shine flashes into their, their flashlights into their faces. <laughs> to which of course Jane responded, yeah, and I'm gonna drive so fast, they're gonna fear for their lives. <laughs> so to those people that we picked up that day, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Over the next couple of years, our adventures included being questioned by the police after ignoring a huge no bridge jumping sign on a highway, sneaking in and out of a major Nashville hotel for an entire summer to use their pool like a season's pass, 
and jumping on a moving train at midnight, which is, might I add, the only time I've ever run faster than Jane. <laughs> Because if you've ever met Jane, you know she was fearless and nothing in this life was going to get her in her way and allow her to not have the best life adventure she could. She never backed down from a dare or a silly suggestion that someone might throw her way. Whether that was picking up a large dead buzzard off the highway to put on someone's porch or testing to see if her college minivan really could go 100 miles an hour on the highway. It did. <laughs> In between all of our Jane and Abby adventures, there was a mutual appreciation, respect, and love between us. Whenever we needed each other, we were always there and invested in what was truly important to each other. I am privileged to work with a senior living community as an activities director Nash in Nashville. Jane would often be, find, be found helping me with our proms, our field trips, our special days with these senior residents in Nashville where we lived. She knew their names, spent time learning their stories and bringing her beautiful light to them regularly. I'll never forget the day after Jane shaved her head for the first time after chemo started taking its effect. She had committed to come that day to a special prom at my community, so I called her a few hours earlier and I said, hey, if you don't feel like coming, I totally understand. She said, oh, of course I'll be there. I'll never forget the moment watching Jane walk through the doors of that senior community with a beautiful bald head that I had never seen with the biggest, most beautiful smile and glow on her face. Because even in the midst of Jane's personal battles, she never failed to show up for people she loved and to continue blessing us with who she was. I believe that many people search for joy and contentment and other people somehow just create it. Jane was one of those people. On some of my dark days, I would call Jane and she would almost ask me, she would almost always ask me the same question. She'd say, Emmy, how is your heart? This last summer, I think she was very intentional when she asked me to do something I'd always said I'll never do. She convinced me to get matching tattoos on our arms. So she drew a tiny heart on my arm and I drew one on hers. These last couple weeks, of I've, as I've looked down and seen that reminder of her lasting presence, both emotionally and physically now, I can't help but hear her ask me, Abby, how is your heart? I have wanted more than anything to look her face to face and tell her how much my heart is breaking since she left this earth. But instead, I'm asking God to relay that message to Jane. So God, please tell Jane, thank you for being the best friend I ever had, and I miss you. As many of you witnessed through Jane's social media pages, she loved planning and announcing all the victories that came within her cancer journey. Most of the time, Jane loved to do that in true Jane style with confetti. The one thing that's brought me so much joy in the last two weeks of thinking of Jane up in heaven is for her to finally have her big cancer-free confetti celebration while hand in hand with the one who made her. Thank you.
Well, good evening, everybody. When planning this service, I intentionally did not place myself right after the video. Then Dad texts me this morning and goes, yeah, I don't want to go after the video. I'd rather go at the end. So I said, cool. So yeah, I am struggling, everybody. But the beautiful thing is, Jane, um, this is what Jane would have wanted. It's for us to be able to spend time sharing not only the fun things about her life, not only the inspiring things about her life, but the faith that drove her, the faith that allowed her to be the person um, that she was, and that is. 
So obviously, as you all know, Jane was an amazing, amazing woman, and there are so many, so many things I can share. There's, there are not enough things, um, there's not enough time, there aren't enough words um, to talk about her grit, her persistence, her dedication, all of those things. But tonight I want to share just a handful of lessons that I learned from her, a handful of things that were, uh, that were really impactful um, to me and that continue, that continue to be impactful to me. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do, though, before I get into that, is I want to honor, um, I actually want to honor somebody else um, tonight. So in, in 2020, as many of you know, uh, Jane, uh, she, we, it was January 2020, we all, uh, us four siblings, drove down to Nashville uh, to move her out of her house and then to send her on to California to, uh, to start some of her treatments. And that was when she was given three to six months uh, to live. So I went out with her initially for the first handful of weeks just to get her settled in. Um, all of my friends uh, at Rev Local and all of my friends and family here at, at Cornerstone really helped and supported me during that time and allowing me to be with Jane. Um, but I, I had to come home at some point. There was some point that I could, I, had a, I have a family, I've got three, I had two, two children, one on the way at the time, and, um, and we were just at the point where Jane needed somebody to be out there full time uh, with her. And I just, wanna, I just wanna say how proud I am of Andrew, my brother. Without, without Andrew, I, we, I truly don't know where Jane would be. He spent two years of his life, two, two years, leaving everything behind to move to California, to stay with Jane, to take care of Jane, to be with Jane, to love Jane, to make sure that she survived, which was a tough, which is a tough thing, um, when she was with Abby, at least. She was a tough thing. <laughs> By herself, she's okay. When Abby came into town, Andrew had to keep a tight leash on those two, for sure. But Andrew, I think, is somebody, the, the, reason, the only reason I bring this up is because if any of you know Andrew, Andrew is not the type of person that would trumpet that from the rooftops. He's the type of person that serves selflessly and humbly. He's the type of person that would do it because he knows it's the right thing to do. And I wanna make sure that we honor, even honor him in this because he spent a, major, a, a good chunk of his life taking care of Jane. And he's gonna need our prayers and our support even moving forward. So I love him, care about him, really thankful for his impact in Jane's life and even the lessons of perseverance and grit that I've even learned from him. So just wanna acknowledge Andrew and tell him thanks. Thanks for doing that. So Jane's impact in my life, honestly, it can't be overstated. There aren't enough words to talk about it. There aren't enough stories to tell. There aren't enough things for me to to even come up with for us, for me to be able to do that. But there were a couple things that I, that, of lessons that I learned, things that I brought, that she brought to me that were helpful. Um, so if any of you know me in any way, shape, or form, you, you will know that I tend to avoid conflict. I'm an avoider by nature. Typically I'm kind of like, you know what, like we can probably find an amicable solution to this. We can talk about it a little bit and kind of make it work. I mean, as, any, as my friends at Rev Local know, like it's not a great way to build a team and grow a career by just being nice to everybody always and giving them everything they want at all moments. Um, so it was one of those things that I've, it is a growth point for me, something that I've been thinking about and, uh, for a while. And so we're, I'm, at the, I'm at the house with Jane and I'm just like kind of walking through the room and she just like out of nowhere, she goes, Mitch, you'd be way more successful if you would just let somebody dislike you. And I was like, I was like, oh, interesting. I didn't know it was unsolicited advice day. So if that's the case, I would really love for you to let me go get my list, bring it in here, and be able to share a little bit of that with you this fine Wednesday. But so we were, so we were, we were kind of talking about it and we we're joking because she was right. She's like, I would be a much more successful person if I would like allow somebody to dislike me at some point. And so we were joking and I was like, you know what, you should write a children's book. Like this would be like, you, this is something you should do, you know. And, and I said, you, well, you know, what do you think you should call it? And she goes, just like this, like, cause it's Jane. She just has it all planned out apparently. She goes, let someone dislike you and see how far you'll go. <laughs> Great. Dr. Seuss <laughs> sort of ring to it. So I was like, all right, all right, all right, I'll give you that. I said, who do you want to illustrate it? Again, boom, she goes, Banksy. And I was like, this is the most self-aware book that's ever been thought of or any sort of existence, like so on the nose. 
but Jane was like consistently like she just I think she knew me better than I knew myself in a lot of ways and Jane was like my best friend for like my entire life and we were just joined at the hip I'm, I'm older than her by 22 months ish and we just would do everything together we would everything from driving to school together driving to practice together anything from taking Andrew when he was very young and sticking him on top of the little tyke's playhouse roof and then just leaving him there <laughs> like we came back inside and mom was like where's Andrew we're like ah he's on the roof we came in to get something to drink but Jane, Jane was one of those people that she always had the right thing to say when, when she needed to say it. And she knew how to do it in such a way, with me at least. She did it with me because we were close enough that she could just be a jerk and I would be like, okay. But the, like, I'm going to miss those things. I'm going to miss those little insights that she had into my life because she was, she was detached from it enough by being in California that she could look into it and she could give me really, really good advice. But another element of Jane's life that I learned, that I learned something from and continue to learn uh, from her, and it's, it's something that's been shared consistently over even this evening, is that Jane was a very generous person. And she wasn't just generous with her money, but she was generous with her time. She was generous with her emotional energy. She was generous with the people that she spent her time with. And she was generous with her money. Like throughout all of her life, she was always giving, always serving, always wanting to help those who were in need. So whether it was, it was kids in the, in the Gar, on Garfield Avenue in Lynchburg just having block parties and having the kids come in and being able to take care of them and help them, or whether it was her taking time out of her life to go over on Thursday nights to the Davidson County Jail in Nashville and sit and read the Bible and pray with people that were in prison. Like, Jane was consistently giving, and she was consistently looking for ways to bless other people. And she, there was just this other's mindset that she had because she understood that that came because Christ had given all of that, she, that he had for her. So how much more should she give all that she has for others? So when Jane, you know, thinks about her money and she thought about the way that her time worked and all those sorts of things, she saw it as a gift to be given, not as something to be hoarded and kept. She was always approaching it that way. And so over the summer, when, we, when she and I were, you know, we were sitting on the roof at the, at the, the Airbnb and San Clemente, where we were, we were sitting on the roof just talking, and I, like, I loved sitting with her and just, just trying to get her to dream. Like, I just wanted to know what was in her head. I was like, where are you going to live? What, do you, like, what kind of car are you going to drive? Are you going to have two houses or are you going to have three houses? You just have one big house. Like, what are you, what are you going to do next? And she was always be like, okay, I'm going to release this album next year, and then I'm going to buy a house in 12 South in Nashville, and really close to Celeste because I love Celeste. And it's, a great, it's a great neighborhood. And she was always dreaming and always thinking. And so we were talking a lot about the, all the GoFundMe money that she had uh, kind of accumulated over the last couple of years because people were very generous towards Jane in her healthcare journey where insurance wouldn't carry, cover treatments and she really was up against a wall. Financially, a lot of people came to the table and really gave. So I was asking Jane, I was like, what do you think we should do you know, with all of that, that cash? Because we didn't feel like it was right for us to keep, especially when she got better. Like that was the thought. I was like, okay, when you get better, what are we going to do? And so we, we were having that conversation, and that was when the idea of the Nightbird Foundation came to, to be, where we would take all of that leftover money and we would create a nonprofit foundation to be able to help those people that were like Jane, that were artists that couldn't afford health insurance, there were, there were artists that couldn't make it um, on their own. Because Jane had actually been part of uh, a couple of those grant programs where she was the direct recipient of people's generosity towards her. So when she and I were talking about that, that was really where the seed was planted. And then when she passed, like, I couldn't help but remember that conversation of like, what would Jane want to do with the money that she had left over? And, we, and so we, we've decided to set up this Nightbird Foundation to be able to carry her legacy forward for people that have uh, breast cancer. And, and, and really, it's because of the generosity that she continued to have throughout her entire life that compels even us now to want to continue that generosity forward. So I'm not, this is not a sales pitch, I'm not telling you to you know, donate or whatever, but if you want to. <laughs> it's on the back of your program, it says Nightbird Foundation. So what we're gonna do is we're, gonna, we're gathering donations through GoFundMe right now, and the goal for us is to be able to create a foundation that's gonna be able to help another Jane. That's gonna be able to help people that are in need, help with travel expenses and help people be able to get the treatment in the places that they want to have it. So the last thing that I want to share is that Jane taught me is she taught me about hope, and she taught me about holding on to promises. 
And as many of you know, I mean, if you don't know by now, I don't know if you've been listening, but Jane's faith was a very large portion of her life. It was a big piece of who she was. So in the midst of her journey, like she consistently relied on her faith to drive her. She consistently relied on her faith to be the thing that gave her the hope that she had. And Andrew alerted to it earlier, like, it's really easy to sing and to worship and to trust God when things are going, like, really well. It's a very difficult thing to do that when you get that cancer diagnosis, when you're struggling to breathe, when you constantly feel horrible, when you don't know whether you're going to see your nieces and nephews at Christmas time. It's a lot harder to trust in the Lord then. And it's a lot harder to have hope when you're up against a wall. But what Jane had was greater than wishful thinking. And what Jane had was more than just this mysterious, intangible light that sort of exists in her, in her being. Like, Jane had a hope. She had a hope that was beyond this world. She had a hope that no matter what the outcome was going to be, whether she lived another 65 years or whether she died last week or two weeks ago, the outcome was going to be good because she knew the promise that the Lord had given her that she was going to be restored, that she was going to be able to be with him forever. And you know what? It's not just something that we think about on on death's door. Like that drove every decision that Jane made. The hope that, that she had was what allowed her to say things like, you don't have to wait till life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. It's the thing that constantly drove her to be the positive inspiration that all of us saw on television. But it wasn't just because Jane pulled herself up by her bootstraps. And it wasn't just because Jane had this innate ability to willpower her way through. And it wasn't just because she was super strong, which she was. She's the strongest woman I've ever met, strongest person I've ever met. All of those things are true about Jane. But they weren't true about Jane because she was Jane. They were true about Jane because, she had, because Jane had a hope in Jesus. Jane's hope wasn't just being famous. It wasn't just money. It wasn't just notoriety. It wasn't any of those things. It was the fact that she was going to be with her Savior forever. So those of us in the room that are followers of Jesus, we can be encouraged by that hope in our circumstances. And I think that's what Jane would want us to hear today is that we don't simply have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We don't simply have to work harder, do better, be gooder. We don't have to do any of those things. But rather, we can rely on the hope that God has never, ever, ever been unfaithful, and he's not going to start today with you. And for those of, of, of you that don't believe in Jesus, that don't have that relationship, that don't rely on him as a hope, like, I really hope and I hope and I pray that today you would see the light that was inside Jane was Christ. And that you have that same access to that hope through Jesus as well. You don't have to fight. You don't have to work. You don't have to do any of those things to find salvation and meaning and satisfaction. You can find it in him. Because at the end of the day, there are a lot of hopeless people out there. There are a lot of hopeless people in this room watching on the live stream. But the good news today is that you don't have to remain hopeless. You don't have to remain hopeless. You don't have to wonder what's going to happen when you die. You're not going to have to wonder what's going to happen with your life. Because Jesus Christ died on that cross for our sins while we were still sinners. He did it before before we did anything. He saw it fit to forgive us. And we have access to that forgiveness today. So today, as Todd's gonna, or my dad's going to come up next, just, let, just, let's just let that roll over in our minds for like the remainder of the night of the fact that the hopeless people in the world have the ability to find hope. And Jane was a perfect picture of what finding that hope looked like. Thank you. Wow. Now you're going to hear from one of the parents. Now I know what was going on down at that college when I'm writing tuition checks. (laughs) Whoa. She would come back with the car and it would be banged up. And I said, well, what happened? I don't know. Never knew, right? 
a fire hydrant hit the car. Um, how, how do you raise someone like a Jane? Yeah, I mean, and I've even thought about this. Um, she was challenging to raise, to be, to be very frank with you. I'm not going to say, yeah, like, no problem. You know, we just read bedtime stories, and the rest is history. Um, I think when I look back, because we're the same temperament. We're both the type A, hard drivers, work long hours, super duper persistent, don't take no for an answer. When you get two people like that in a home, sometimes it doesn't always work out. So <clears throat> as I look back, I kind of let her raise herself in a way, and I just kind of kept the guardrail, I just widened the guardrails. So when she would get to where she was really getting ready to go off the rails, I would step in. Um, get her around good friends, good people, so important. The parties were always at my house. I'm telling you, I buy everything. Everybody comes over here, get to know the friends, get to interact with them. And she had great friends. I loved all her friends. She enjoyed bringing her friends home from college. And um, one time she, I mean, I, I didn't think anything of it. I, you know, sit down and talk, you know, what do you want to do? What, you know, how, how's things going and stuff? And she would mention to me weeks later, she says, boy, I just loved it when you'd sit around the table and talk with my friends. Didn't know that. But it was important to her. Um, you know, and this is no credit to us necessarily, but I'm, I, I, she had three interviews on CNN, and I'm finding myself literally taking notes. No kidding. Pausing it, writing it down. Pausing it, writing it down. And I was amazed myself that kind of wisdom and perception and profound ways of looking at things, I never saw that around the house. But the right environment, <laughs> never saw it, never heard it. Honest to goodness. But God has a way of just arranging circumstances to bring that out in some other forum. And um, I'm never going to forget, you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore until you decide to be happy. Change my life. As parents, we're creating things that are lasting a lifetime, beyond our lifetime. You get to choose what that is. You get to shape what that is but it's going to last beyond your lifetime. And you're never done parenting your children, even now. Like Mitch is 32. We've got the fourth grandchild on the way. I don't really consider that I'm done parenting. I mean, it's different. It's not the same kind of parenting. But I'm, I'm very aware that if I mess up, I'm that bird at the front of the triangle that all that whole flock of birds could go down. So I'm not messing up. I made up my mind, not going to happen. It's a big responsibility, parents and grandparents. They're still watching you. They're still watching you. When you saw some of those earlier pictures, kind of the nickname that I gave Jane when she was um, growing up, it says, Janie, you got a million dollar smile. And that just kind of stuck. And when I would see her, even when I saw her in San Clemente, you know, an hour before I knew she was even going to pass away, I said, you still have that million dollar smile. And she did. I'd like to say how important all of you are in all of this not just in this room, but people actually around the world. I mean, I get emails from the Philippines, from Australia, from Africa, just all over the place. All kinds of testimonies, people that were going to give up until they watched the video, it popped up on the YouTube, it's okay. 
and they decided not to give up. Things that simple. I asked Jane a few weeks ago, I said, I know you get a lot of these as well as I do. Um, it, I get stuff at my, it's like kind of like when you're a kid, Santa Claus, North Pole, all they write is Nightbird, Zanesville, Ohio. It, it goes to the mayor's office, <laughs> Zanesville mayor. So he'll call me up, says, Mitch, I got a couple more packages. You gonna be there? Sure. But every one of you guys are really important because she would, she would not have made it to that show if it wasn't for the, the specialized treatments that she was getting at the uh, Center for New Medicine in Irvine, California. She wouldn't have made it. And those things are expensive. And it's cash only, and the insurance doesn't pay for it, and the Social Security doesn't pay for it. But you guys, I think God makes it that way on purpose so that you get to play a part in her blessing on everybody. Because without your prayers, without your encouragement, without your $5, $10, $20—we would not have had the money to, go, to walk into that clinic and write a check. She, she, I was convinced she was within days of passing away. I mean, I've never been around dying people to be able to compare, so I've never been in a hospital setting, and, I'm, and those who have certainly would know these things. But she, she had what I would call a death cough when she was at our home. And I, I just don't think she, she was going to last a week even more. And I, I even told that to, to my wife. Um, but we managed to get her down to Southern California, get her in the clinic. Um, Andrew really stepped up to the plate. Um, we have a, me and Andrew have this little thing going. It's just between me and him. Nobody else gets to participate in this. He's a three-star general in my army now. He's a lieutenant general. When he went down there, I made him a brigadier general, one star. The Lord gave me this idea. Then she was becoming, she needed just more care, like 24 hours a day. He was a software developer, so he could do his work anywhere in the world. But he couldn't even concentrate on his work, so he resigned his job. Didn't ask me, didn't tell anybody. And when, I, when that got back to me, I said, Andrew, I'm promoting you to a major general. That's a two-star general. And so when he was flying back, I made him a three-star general when he was on that plane. This is just a thing between me and him. That's the kind of respect that I have for him. But Jane would not have made it without you guys helping. Three words that I think of when I think of Jane. Number one, creativity. She has her songs, she can write poetry, she can do skits, she can do pranks, as you've seen. Whoa. Um, just, just immense creativity just oozing out of her. The second thing is energy. Absolute energizer bunny all the time. Just an amazing amount of energy that she had. And the third thing is what we call in, in the Polish language, it's called zukfawosht. The, the Hebrew word is chutzpah. The English word is audacity. She had audacity. America's Got Talent does not like original songs. They don't like them. They don't do well. They tried to talk her out of doing that original song. They wanted something like Annie of Tomorrow or something from a, a Broadway show, things that people would recognize and hum along to just in case your voice wasn't all that great. At least there was something redeeming about that person's performance. But she absolutely insisted that she wanted to do It's Okay. So here she is telling them, you know, it, you know I mean, it's like she didn't have any negotiating leverage to tell them that. <laughs> um, but she had that audacity and she just had that 
that gut feel that it would work, that it would fly, and it, and it did. So the creativity, the energy, the audacity, and I probably would add one more in there, is she really had an amazing intellect. I really enjoyed, just as an adult, conversing with her and interacting with her. She was well-read, she knew what was going on in the world, she could figure things out, she was a logical, rational thinker. I really appreciated those things as a dad. And I know not everybody does as friends, it's more, you know, uh, other things, and that's fine. But she really had a, she just really had an amazing intellect that I just really, really enjoyed interacting with. And we would talk about business, and we would talk about, you know, these contracts that these places want her to sign. Um, and uh, I was really looking forward to, and she trusted me immensely, and I was really looking forward to working with her in the years to come. But God had other plans, and that's fine. His timing is always perfect. It's always perfect. But she was absolutely fascinating to me. There were just so many facets to her personality. I never got bored with her. A couple of funny stories and then I'll close. Um, well, this one's not really a funny story. I'll close on the funny story. But back to, I, I was very proud of her before, way before she went on America's Got Talent. Just so super proud of her. If she never went on there, she's my girl with the million dollar smile, always will be. Um, but I visited her one time, I think it was Andrew, Caitlin and myself, I think it was back in 2013, and she lived in Lynchburg in a certain neighborhood, and just lots of kids and you can't find the parents. She, t she like took every kid under her wing, I'm telling you. Because when I went down there, she had a block. She knew I was traveling down there. It could be on that weekend. That's when she schedules the block party with all these kids. And so she says, Dad, we need a picnic table. Can you go to Lowe's and get a picnic table? I go, okay. I go, bring it back, put it together. We, we need food. We need this. We need it. Okay, fine. We'll go get it. Bring it out. There were kids anywhere, just, just filled in the house. And she would do Bible studies with the kids. She would, um, she would call me on the phone. She said, and I forget the names now, but this one 12-year-old gave his heart to the Lord. And she said, Dad, I'd like to give him a Bible with his name on it. Can you get one? I said, you bet. So I'd order a Bible with the name on it, send it down there. I'd send cases of Bibles down to her. I said, anything you need to minister to those kids, you tell me. We'll get her down there to you. But she was always just all the time doing those kinds of things. And I was so in love with her, in, 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 a, in a sense. I was just so proud of her when I went down there, and she was just doing all that. And then I said, well, I want to go to your church. Let's go to your church. She says, great. So we get in the car, and she says, well, we got to pick up somebody. We pick up like four kids on the way to church. Yeah. And we're there early, and she's out on the playground playing with them, going up and down the slide and everything else. I was just so proud of her at that moment of how she shared her faith and shared her energies with other people. Um, she got one girl dressed up for her first job interview, got her a dress, got her made up. She might have been 15 or something like that. Kids in those neighborhoods end up working at young ages. Um, and just, it, it, just was, it was just such a blessing, just such a blessing. Um, so kind of the one funny story, it's kind of funny, but a little bit serious. She, she walked across the stage at Liberty University in 2013 to get her degree, but she did not fulfill all the requirements. And all she had to do, she did an internship at a church, and all she had to do was get the signature of the pastor, and you're done. That's it. Let's get a signature. So I'm wanting this degree to come in so I can frame it and put it on the wall. So I'm saying, Jane, when are you going to do it? I'll get around to it. It was, over, it was like a year and a half, and she was not getting around to it. I was getting concerned here. Um, I paid for some of that. 
So I told Sharon, I said, I mean, and, she, and Jane was just on to other things. I don't need the degree, that's what she told me. I said, all you need is one signature. Yeah, but I don't need it. Like I said, you raise them and you put the guardrail out here and one out here and you just try to keep them in there if you, if you can. So, I, so I, I told Sharon, I said, Sharon, I says, give her a call. I says, I'm coming down this weekend. I'm driving down there and I'm going to pick her up, put her in the car. We're driving that church. And I says, there is a chance that I might be in jail for a domestic violence, <laughs> but I'm willing to flip the coin on it. I want that degree on the wall so bad officially. And so Sharon made the phone call and she decided that she didn't need me down there. And we got the degree. So that's kind of, that doesn't top some of the things Abby talked about, but there you go. Thank you. funeral crowd I've ever been a part of. <laughs> Mitch Jr. hates, I don't even know where he went, he hates when there's like a gap, when there's a gap in the time. So part of that's for you, my man, just because I love you. Well, uh, my name is Todd Garman. I'm the pastor here at Cornerstone Church, and we are uh, just thrilled and delighted that so many of you are here to celebrate and support the Marcheski family. Uh, we love the Marcheski family, and uh, I've, I've known this family for about 15 years, and it's been a delight uh, to know uh, Mitch and Sharon, and Mitch, and Jane, and Andrew, and Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin, I don't know where she went, but that song was absolutely breathtaking. That was outstanding. Uh, I don't know where she went, but my goodness, that was beautiful, wasn't it? Well, we are uh, going to wrap up our service here shortly. But I wanted to share a few things, uh, not just about Jane, but also about the God that she loved and about the Jesus that Mitch talked about and Andrew talked about and so many of you have spoken about her faith. Um, I met Jane when she was 17 and she had, uh, was, was involved in a, a big church in Columbus and she, the first time I met her she was already angry and feisty. And I was like, all right, we've got, we've got ourselves a little spitfire here. And she was mad that dad had pulled her out of the church that she loved and was making her go to some new church that was probably filled with weirdos and lamos that weren't going to be cool. So she did. She came to my house to interview me. Like, I got a few questions about this youth group you're in. Which is, as I came to find out, just quintessential Jane. I heard feisty, spirited, hootspun. I'm not even going to try the Polish word, but it was awesome, whatever it was. That was, uh, I came to uh, know and really love this young lady because she was one of the biggest troublemakers I'd ever been around. And I am a troublemaker and have been told that my whole life. So to see like a junior female version was thrilling for me. But at the same time, Mitchell, when you said her dad said, Jane was challenging to raise. I might say that she was challenging to lead as well. I can completely empathize with the guardrails. Jane uh, loved Jesus. And I've never been around a leader that was as naturally gifted at connecting with young people. She was, Abby said, magnetic. That is, she was magnetic like the North Pole is magnetic. I've never seen someone with such a dynamism with young people. People just wanted to be around her. She was committed. She was like, I want young people to know. I want high school kids to know that following Jesus doesn't have to be this boring, dull, lifeless garbage that's foisted upon people from so many churches today. She was so committed to helping young people know that following Jesus was a life of adventure and fullness. And she was amazing at it. She was incredibly ornery. 
She was incredibly ornery and caused all kinds of trouble, but that was sort of part of her charm too, wasn't it? Most of you that uh, experienced some of her irreverence, my kids uh, woke me up one morning and said, Dad, uh, the car just left the driveway and apparently they wrote the word dude on our lawn in pancakes. And I looked out the window and knowing full well it had to have been Jane, I said, buddy, you are reading that upside down. Jane wrote that and I guarantee you she wrote the word poop on our lawn. <laughs> Which she said, oh yeah, it was totally poop. Jane also covered my car, bumper to bumper, in pancakes. What was the pancake? But listen, this is what's amazing about that. Do you know how many hundreds of pancakes you need to make to write the word poop on somebody's lawn and cover their car bumper to bumper? There are existent photos of Jane and her little minions, a couple of whom are in here, with a just that whiff of a, of a pancake griddle peeking out from behind there, she could convince people to do anything. She's the only person I know that would say, I got a great idea. Let's turn our minivan into cash cab. Let's, let's flip 500 pancakes and, and spell semi-naughty words on people's lawn. Let's do that and be able to pull people together. She, she was at once insanely gifted at ministering to high school and middle school kids about the love of Christ, the full life in Christ. She also pushed the bounds of reverence and she was a troublemaker, but would always walk that line and yes, have that smile that let you know she knew exactly what she did and was pretty proud of it. One a particular summer, it's already been hinted at, so I'm just gonna go after it. We were at a summer camp, it was a middle school church camp with a number of other churches there. And uh, the leader of the camp, the head of the camp, pulls me aside one morning, he says, Todd, hey, um, I just need to let you know something happened last night and, and uh, we gotta talk to you about it. And I'm like, what? He says, I think some of your campers some of the female campers, they kind of got out of the cabin after hours, not that they were like locked in, I mean they left cabin after hours and apparently were skinny dipping in the lake. And I said, my friend, I have some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is I am 100% confident it was not middle school kids. The bad news is it was my leader, Jane. <laughs> and two other leaders that she suckered into doing it with her. So I had to go have a conversation with Jane. Jane, even before I talked to Jane, I said to this guy, how did you find out about this? This is where it gets fun. He says, well, apparently there were also some middle school boys that were out wandering around. I don't know who was in charge of security at this camp. I don't know, I don't know this was exactly what parents were hoping for. But apparently some middle school boys stumbled upon what must have only seemed to them the greatest thing they'd ever seen in their life. As three naked young women frolicked in the pond and because they're little nuclear hormones, they couldn't wait 20 seconds before telling everyone in their cabin, too, we saw some girls, they were naked saw some middle school girls. So when I went to Jane, I said, Jane, do, you, 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 why do you put me in these positions? Why do you do that? And she's kind of smiling and she goes, actually, I overheard those boys telling their camp, their counselor, that this is the best church camp they've ever been to. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> and I said, pump the brakes there, kiddo. Did you not hear that you were mistaken for a sixth grade girl? <laughs> That's not funny, Todd. I am a little person. <laughs> Nonetheless, she, Jane, Jane was, listen, isn't this true? 
she was amazing. If you ever had a conversation with Jane, she was wonderful at making you feel like you were, she was all about, she was focused on you. At the same time, have you ever met anyone more enamored of themselves than Jane? Jane had this amazing ability to hold both of these things in tension, so I didn't know whether to be excited or con concerned. Just a, a little while ago, she, uh, she came and, and spoke at a women's event here, and she, I connected with her in the sound booth, and I hadn't seen her in a while, and she gave me a hug. She said, Todd, I'm so glad to see you. I said, oh, thanks, it's good to see you too. She said, I, I've been thinking about something, and I wanted to let you know, this is gonna sound like a, a brag. Just wait till the end, I promise. She says, Todd, I wanted to tell you something. There's a lot of, there's been a lot of, of, of men, mentors in my life, but I wanted to tell you how important your opinion has always, has always been, and I've always wanted to make you, you proud. And I go, oh my gosh, Jane, I, first of all, that's so nice, that's so touching. And, and of course, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of you. I'm incredibly amazed at watching what you did. Now, you may think, gosh, Todd, sweet brag, hold the phone. Three weeks later, I hear a girl in a bubble on the radio, and I send her a text, and I'm like, Jane, just heard your song. Man, I loved it, as, as with all of them. It was fantastic. I loved the lyrics. I loved the music. You're just doing a great job. Keep being a light of Christ. I'm so, I'm so uh, grateful for how you're living your life. She responds, who is this? <laughs> to which I say, Todd. And she says, no, worse. She says, I don't know any Todds. <laughs> and I said, Jane, Todd Garman. And she laughs, ha, 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 ha. I don't know if you know this, Todd. It's really hard to keep track of everyone. I'm pretty famous now. <laughs> Do you see the tension? That's why uh, Mitch has so much gray. That's why I have so much gray for Pete's sake. Jane, Jane was uh, a marvelously funny person. She was every bit of what you've heard all these people say selfless as well. She mentored dozens of young women in this county when she was working with our youth group, some of whom are here tonight because of how important she was. My own daughter is one of them. Uh, my own daughter said, Jane helped middle school Hallie know that it was, it was okay to be me. Jane helped middle school Hallie get through middle school knowing that there was someone that loved me and cared about me and wanted to teach me about Jesus. That continues to be an extraordinary legacy, Mitch. She was, she, I love to hear the stories when she was in Lynchburg and she would minister to all these neighborhood kids. She was continuing to do it. When she went to Nashville, going into the jail, Jane was certainly uh, other centered in that way. There's a, there's a social media post, I don't know, on one of her, you know, because she's famous, one of her thousand channels, but it's a picture of her, a bunch of pictures of her at a youth camp, I think it was 2019, continuing to do ministry with young people, and she says, youth camp Jane is the best Jane, and I couldn't agree more. I think we all know, many people know Jane because of Simon's daggum golden buzzer. I think we all understand, we, many people know Jane as a monstrously talented musician and lyricist and singer. I don't think that was the best part of Jane. I don't think it was. I'm convinced that the greatest uh, part about Jane was her hunger and pursuit of Jesus. In fact, I'll go so far as to say this, just like her brother said, if when we think of Jane, our admiration for Jane stops at Jane, we'll be missing something very major. Because Jane was a reflection of the Jesus that she loved. The reason she was so magnetic, magnanimous, others-centered, servant-hearted, 
intentional was because she was imitating imperfectly the Jesus of the scriptures. Andrew, I might add, is an, is a, is an imperfect example of Jesus as well, isn't he? That's a young man that's got some Christ character in him. But we're not talking about you, Andrew. We're talking about Jane, so don't be selfish. <laughs> Jane reflected the Jesus that she loved. Because as we read the scripture, and whether you're here tonight or watching on live stream at somewhere, you read the Gospels in the New Testament, and you'll read about this Jesus that was unbelievably intentional, that was unbelievably direct, that was even feisty, a little bit irreverent. He pushed the boundaries a little bit. Sounds like someone I know. Jesus was the perfect picture of God. In fact, the writer of Colossians writes, Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God. And God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. So just as much as the Sistine Chapel is a, it's a, it's a, uh, piece of artwork by Michelangelo just as much as the Mona Lisa is a reflection of da Vinci Jane is a reflection of Jesus and what do we know about Jesus that he was the perfect picture of God in the gospel of John Jesus uh, himself says this He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his sheep. If, if Jane was a reflection of Jesus, Jesus was the perfect embodiment of who God is. Jesus offered an invitation to all that would hear him and listen to him. And his invitation was, come unto me. Come unto me. I will give you rest. I will give you full life. And I dare say that if and as we think about Jane, the things that we loved about her are perfectly seen in the Jesus that she loved. I want to turn to John chapter 6 some promises that Jesus said to any that would recognize, yes, I do have a sin problem and I need Jesus. This is what he promises. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. 
That is the hope that Mitch was talking about. Not a wispy, ethereal, ethereal positive thinking, but a certainty and assurance that this Jesus that Jane loved will in fact raise her up on the last day such that she can live and die with peace and with hope and with joy and with strength and leave a legacy behind that continues to point people to Jesus. My daughter, who I was talking about before, who loved Jane and was loved well by Jane. I'm so grateful for Jane uh, and her influence in Hallie's life. Hallie just got back from a spring break trip where she was down uh, with a church group. And there was a young lady on that trip who was sort of accidentally on the trip, wasn't really part of the church or the church group. And, uh, but throughout the course of the week, came to put her faith in Christ and even was baptized uh, down in the ocean down there in Destin, and it was a marvelous uh, activity. And she said to Hallie, Hallie, are you really flying back to Ohio to be at this funeral for your friend? And Hallie said, yes, and let me tell you about Jane. And she shared about Jane and how influential and impactful and what a mentor she was and a role model she was. And when she looked over, this young lady started, was crying. And Hallie said, why are you crying? And this young lady says, I feel like I'm benefiting from what Jane was in your life. Isn't that marvelous? That Jane's legacy continues. And someone breathed into her as well. This is why if you are listening, if you're here, if you're listening on live stream, may I urge you, the God of the heavens is real. And he calls to you. And he says, come unto me. And when we put our faith in him, when we live our lives with him, we can experience full life. Even in suffering, we can experience full life and joy and peace. And we can have assurance of full life now and in heaven. Which is why Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, But we, we who have put our faith in Christ... And maybe that's you, friend, that would put your faith in Christ. But we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise. First, then we who are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with these words our comfort is not the comfort of oh buck up little camper sending happy thoughts your way that's nonsense that's empty air but we comfort one another with these words that Jane put her faith and trust in Christ and we believe Christ when he says, I will come again. We believe the words of the scripture that says he will come again and raise those who are asleep. And then those who are alive will join him as well. And we will be with the Lord forever. And that's the hope that Jane walked in and lived in and shared with so many people. That's what she was a reflection of. And so the invitation is for all of us that would hear have you put your faith in this Christ? Have you put your faith in this Jesus? Whatever town you're from, whatever state you're from, wherever you're listening from, whatever church you're going to, may I urge you, put your faith in this Christ. Find a Bible-believing church and press in to know this Jesus that Jane knew. And that was the very heartbeat of her life. We're going to end our, our service. Uh, uh, Mitch is going to come and, and uh, sing again. And while he leads us in a song, we're going to stand, not yet. We'll stand and sing. We will have uh, here, there, there, there's various members from different churches that are here tonight that would love to pray with any of you. Any of you that have prayer requests or prayer needs. It can be about anything. We can honor Jane 
by honoring the one that she loved. There will be people stationed uh, in, in front, perhaps around the corner. If you have a prayer need about anything, we would welcome you to come forward and receive prayer. If you have never received this Jesus, if you've kept God at arm's length, perhaps you've used to follow God but turned hard left, do you not hear what we're celebrating in this young lady? Do you not hear what we're celebrating, that full life is found in Christ? You're here because you love Jane. I promise you the things you loved about Jane are in their fullness in Christ. Would you receive him? Would you give your life to him? We would love to pray with you as you do that. Let me pray and then Mitch is going to lead us in a song. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our dear sister Jane. And I thank you that she was ornery. She was a pain in the rear end sometimes, or as her sister-in-law put it, she could just be a pill. It's true. I thank you, God, that you make feisty young women that are fierce and challenging and passionate and committed and ministry-minded and other-centered and just a little bit ornery. I thank you, God, for the gift that was Jane in so many people's lives. And I thank you most of all that Jane is a reflection of your son, Jesus, and that Jesus continues to beckon us into relationship with him. Lord, there is no other way to the Father. We know that. There is no other way to heaven. We know that except to call on the name of Jesus. So I pray that anyone that hears this would seriously investigate. Your son would read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and would put their faith and trust in the only one that can save, in the only one that can raise. We love you, Heavenly Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. And may I invite you, if you have prayer requests for anything, you come forward and receive prayer. We'd love to pray with you.
being with us tonight. This has been an amazing time remembering Jane and celebrating the life that she has in Jesus. Again, if you have any prayer needs, if you need to talk about the hope that we have and you wish to have that, we are more than happy and more than welcome uh, to chat with you. Otherwise, have a great night. Drive safe, getting out of here, and we love each and every one of you. Thanks so much. <laughs>